I needed to take a break before reviewing this episode just so I could collect myself, because my god, this one is one special kind of bad. The writing keeps getting worse, the story is dragging, and the main characters are horrible people. The showrunners once said they want to write the novel Tolkien never wrote. Well, they fail. They not only didn't write that novel, they've completely bastardized his story. This is a mockery of the world that he created. They're using names and locations and characters from the stories, but there is no Tolkien here. It's all the showrunners, and it's incredibly bad. Let's just start from the top. The episode opens with Nori and Meteor Man eating. He's still trying to learn to speak. We're five episodes into the series, and he still can't talk. Nori then explains how the Paleolithic leprechauns migrate, and then talks about all the dangers they face along the way from the gringos. She uses some word, pear, parent, I don't, I don't really care. They're gringos. The gringos kill things, so Meteor Man says he's a gringo because he killed the fireflies, but Nori's like, it's fine, it was an accident. She tells him he's good, and he repeats it like he's the Iron Giant. Gringo, good. And then Nori's parents call them back to the group. Nori's dad is still injured, and the caravan has completely ditched them. Not a single person has come back to even check on them. They just kept walking. What do they do when someone gets hurt along the way? Before I gave them a pass when they were talking about those who fell behind because I thought they weren't leaving them to die, but it looks like that's exactly what they're doing. You hurt your foot, they leave you. You break a wheel, they leave you. Your family gets killed in the landslide, like Nori's friend's family, they leave you. These people are monsters, and it's going to get worse. Much worse. Anyway, Nori's dad asks the friend to sing some song her mother used to sing, and it's fine. It's a song that's there because Tolkien wrote songs into his stories. However, the line, not all those who wander are lost, is from a riddle written by Bilbo Baggins about Aragorn. I know it's a good line, but why are you using it? It's specifically tied to Aragorn. It'd be like using one ring to rule them all for some random orc song. Come on, you can do better. Well, wait, scratch that. You should be better than that. After suffering through the whole song, we meet who I originally assumed was Discount Ben Foster playing Sauron, but it turns out not to be Sauron or a man. These women tracked the falling star and found the crater Meteor Man left. This is the first and only time we see them, so we have no idea who or what they are or what's their purpose. But we do know this woman is having the worst cramps in all of Middle Earth. If she frowned any harder, she'd cry diamonds. Then it cuts to Adar looking at the sun one last time before, as he says, it'll be gone. I'm assuming this means covering the world in darkness. The scene itself is fine. The issue is that we know nothing about Adar, so his mourning over the sun is meaningless. This is a common problem with the show, and it's gotten worse as they've added more characters. No one gets enough screen time to develop a personality, and we get no backstory, so the audience has no connection to the character. This is a problem because when the writers want to do something impactful, it fails because they never told us why it's important. Who is Adar? Why is he aligned with the orcs? Is he aligned with Sauron or Morgoth? The answer to those questions, just one of them, could give this moment some meaning. Without it, he's just staring at the sun because. There's also an orc who tells him that the trench is complete, and it's the one Theo cut in the previous episode. Adar asks to see his arm, and the wound smokes in the sun. I'm not sure what the point of this was, because we already know orcs don't like the sun. If it was to show that Adar cared about the wounded orc, that could have been done by having Adar approach the orc to show his concern. The writing on the show is so weird. It's like everything's being done to check a box. This must happen, and then this must happen. But it's not done in a way that serves a story. It's just there, and it makes no sense. For example, Bronwyn tells everyone in the tower that the enemy will spare them if they bend the knee. She wants people to stand with her and fight, and a handful of people agree with her. Why? Why are you listening to her? Why is she even in charge? Nothing in the show ever explains this. Bronwyn is some nobody healer who dry humps an elf. Why is she the default leader? Because she told them to go to a tower that has no food or supplies? Or because she told everyone to hunt rabbits in the forest surrounded by orcs instead of going back to the towns to get the stocks of food they all knew were there? As a leader, she's failed. Why is she still in charge? I know the answer is because she has a vagina, but in context to this ridiculous show, why is she in charge when she couldn't do something as simple and necessary as getting food? And it appears the others agree. The old man from the tavern tells everyone that they have a better chance of surviving if they side with Adar. Arande tries to talk him out of this, but the dude writes him off as being an elf. Bronwyn then tries to win everyone back by saying that together they can survive this, but the old man says that with Agar they will, and then Bronwyn just gives up and lets half the people leave. So much for that strong woman shtick. She got talked down in two minutes. The old man tries to get Theo to come with him, but the boy stays. Then we get a good scene. 
Isildur tries to convince Elendil to include him on the mission to Middle-earth, but his father turns him down. He points out that while Isildur has been pretending to care about Numenor, everyone else was actually caring and living their lives for something greater than themselves. It's a good scene because it breaks down Isildur's massive character flaw. He has no purpose and no drive. Of course, that's if you ignore the previous episodes that implied Isildur had a drive to go to western Numenor to be with his brother Anarion, and I guess keep the old ways. He's done with that now, 24 hours later. Because it seems like it's only been a day since he deliberately endangered the lives of the crew on the ship so he'd get booted out of the sea guard so he could go west. Then, the next morning, he wants to go to Middle-earth. Any reason why he suddenly changed his mind? No. Nothing. You don't want to give a hint why he would go through all the trouble of telling his father he wanted to wait a year before joining the ship? Or why he got himself booted out by almost killing people? It makes sense to you that he just randomly changed his mind. Because it doesn't to me, just like his non-existent sister being against the war. Aarian tries to talk to Farazan to get him to get Queen Bee to call off the war. For some reason, she thinks he'd hear her when everyone else is shouting at him. When that doesn't work, she does what every strong woman does tries to use his son to do her work for her. She tells Kimmon to ask his father to stop the war, and when he tells her that his father doesn't listen to him, she tells him to speak louder, and then maybe she'll give him a crumb of pussy. Now, I have a basic question. Why does she want to stop the war? We've gotten a handful of scenes with her, and none of them had anything to do with the elves, politics, or Farazan. We know nothing about this woman, except that she comes from a family loyal to the old ways. Why does she want to stop the war? Whatever you want to do with her, you have to show it on screen. You can't expect people to just know what's going on. Meanwhile, Discount Aragorn gets called to meet with Queen Bee, Farazan, and Strong Woman to help them plan their attack. He thinks he's just giving general info, but Queen Bee says he'll be a great help once they reach Middle-earth, which is news to him. See, Strong Woman told Queen Bee that Discount Aragorn was eager to help his people and to become king, and that was an obvious lie. So now he's ass out, and Queen Bee knows Strong Woman isn't just insufferable, but also a lying manipulator. How much of a manipulator? When Queen Bee and Farazan leave, Discount Aragorn checks Strong Woman for speaking on his behalf, and she lets him know that she found out it was him who told Farazan about where she was going to go when she escaped. So to return the favor, she lied to Queen Bee about him wanting to be king. When he calls her on using him, she says that she convinced the queen to send troops to fight for his people and put a crown on his head so people might assume he used her. And do you know what this would-be king says to that? Fuck the crown. He yanks off his fake Elisar, the thing proving he's king, and leaves it on the table. Well played, strong woman. This is our main character. This is the person we're supposed to root for, and she's a conniving twat. She's not just using Discount Aragorn and Queen Bee, but also putting 500 men's lives at risk just to pop her revenge cherry. It's like no one she encounters has any value to her. All she cares about is her mission. There's nothing likable about this character, and she gets worse in this episode, but not as bad as the Hobbits. So Nori and her family finally catch up to the rest of the caravan. However, along the way, Nori and her friend notice wolf tracks. Further ahead, one of the Black Hobbits is nagging Lenny Henry about the mushrooms on the trees. See, there's never been so few, so like a normal person, she blames Meteor Man. It's his fault the food is scarce. Never mind that he landed dozens if not hundreds of miles away from this place, so how in the fuck could he make the mushrooms scarce? No, it's just his fault, which is why she tells Lenny Henry that they should do what they should have done in the first place. Take the wheels off of Nori's family's cart and leave them stranded in the wilderness. What that means is that they've done this before. No one says something like that if it's not a thing they do. So let's put this in context from what's in the show. They can't find enough food, so they find someone to blame for it and then abandon them. These people are evil. You made the hobbits, the only men naturally capable of resisting the power of the One Ring because of their inherent good nature. You made the hobbits evil. I give you the rings of power. Then a wolf attacks, and Nori and her friends save this old woman. They get cornered and then Meteor Man shows up and hits the ground and saves them but injures his arm in the process. Back in Numenor, we get this ridiculous ass sparring match. The newbies are sword training, but they suck, so Elendil has strong woman go to give them lessons. She starts by insulting them, saying she'll make it as simple as possible, and challenges them to try and land a cut on her. And then Elendil, for no reason, adds that whoever succeeds will become lieutenant. We then get one of the goofiest fight scenes since The Last Jedi, where these people are not even trying to hit this woman. They're aiming at her sword most of the time. They gang up on her, but attack her one or two at a time, so there are moments, like this one, where she's pinned, but not really, 
two of them, but the other three, who have clear shots at her, like this dude behind her, just stand there and do nothing. One dude just hangs by the fucking pots for half the goddamn fight. I know part of the fight is shot in slow motion, but you do know you don't have to act in slow motion, right? You've got this fool trying to block a sword with her bare hand, or missing her timing and covering her face before a strong woman cuts the net above her. When the timing isn't off, the fight scenes look more like a dance. There's no sense any of them are being overpowered or outclassed by strong woman. They're just going with the flow. I'll leave the rest of the fight analysis to Shadowversity. That's his milieu. I want to talk about the context of this fight. We're supposed to think this shows off strong woman's skill and power, but it doesn't because she's fighting noobs. This is like some pro wrestler out wrestling 10 year olds. They have no idea what they're doing. In fact, that's the point. They don't know what they're doing. You're supposed to teach them how to fight, not have them flail around embarrassing themselves for five minutes so you can have a joygasm. It's not impressive to watch someone who's better pick on someone who's not. If the goal was to show she was a badass, then it would make more sense for her to watch the Numenorean soldiers train the noobs, and then the soldiers could either challenge her to prove her skill, or she could comment on their training methods, which would lead to her sparring with them, and then she could humiliate them, the trained soldiers, proving how good she actually is. No, instead you have her beat up a bunch of beginners, one of whom manages to just nick her arm, so he becomes a lieutenant. Right, so a guy who could barely fight and has never been off his island is going to be placed in charge of people because he cut some broad shirt. Did you read the script before you shot this? Why would you put him in charge? He doesn't know anything. At any rate, Isildur and Discount Aragorn watch the fight. After it ends, Discount Aragorn does some foot trick to pick up a sword and hand it to Isildur's friend, the one who won. Strong Woman comments about this little trick because it shows Discount Aragorn knows how to fight, but he just walks away. Meanwhile, Kimmon embarrasses himself when he tries to get Farazan to oppose the war. The boy's pleas don't work until he accuses his father of wanting to take orders from an elf. And then Farazan sends everyone around them away, showing how connected he truly is, and then tells his son that this whole thing is a ruse. The point of supporting the war isn't for the elves or to help the Southlands, but instead to put a king on the throne that will owe Numenor. This will then allow Numenor to create trading posts, provinces, and colonies, and essentially become an empire which Kimmy never thought about because he's cuntstruck. Speaking of which, you should watch Deadwood instead of this show. It's got excellent writing. Of course, since Numenor is a seafaring nation, you'd think they'd already travel to Middle-earth and set up ports, trading colonies, and such. I wouldn't need a war to do this, and wouldn't fear anyone since they were the most powerful technologically advanced men in the world. You know, like in the books. That would explain in part why they have a military force. After all, their island is in the middle of nowhere. They're at no risk of anyone coming to attack them. But then that would make sense, and this isn't that kind of show. Instead, it appears Numenor cut itself off from the entire world for hundreds, if not a thousand years, and just sailed around the island in a fucking circle. See, in the books, the Edine took a couple hundred years to leave Eriador to go to Numenor, and then traveled back during the fight against Sauron. The men of the region remembered these tall, technologically advanced men. When the Numenorians showed up again, they freely joined the seafarers, not realizing that the Numenorians would eventually become tyrants. They were already tyrants when Farazan took power. If you're gonna change the timeline, you have to make the changes make sense. Why would a seafaring nation stick to their island? Why wouldn't they travel? Why wouldn't they trade with other men? Why wouldn't they set up colonies? They have all these ships and armies. For what? If they're not going anywhere, why do they have them? Anyway, Queen Bee meets with her father who tells her not to go to Middle-earth because all she will find is darkness. Whatever. That's not important. What's important is that Nori is the dumbest hobbit to ever live. Meteor Man sticks his injured arm in water. Nori comes up and tells him that the hobbits now like him since he saved the old woman. And Nori sees that the water starts turning to ice and it grows up the man's arm. And like a total moron, Nori touches the dude's arm and the ice starts growing on her. Meteor Man chants some broken elvish, and the ice explodes, sending Nori flying. When he tries to help her, she runs away. But even better, now his hand is fixed. This is literally the same plot from the first time they met. He can't control his powers. We got it the first three times you did it. Move on. Actually, I regret those words, because it leads to the dumbest, most lore-breaking part of this show. It's just unbelievable anyone would do this to Tolkien's work. Just madness. Here's what happens. Gil-Galad invites Durin to dinner, and before they complete the toast, he asks, in a very roundabout way, about the mithril Durin discovered. Durin tries to dodge the question, but Gil-Galad persists, so Durin makes up this lie about the stone the table is made of being sacred to the dwarves, so the High King says he'll send it back. After dinner, Elrond questions Gil-Galad about the real reason he sent Elrond to Khazad-dûm. 
He guesses correctly that Gilgal had sent him to find the Mithril, but because of the oath he swore to Durin, Elrond won't admit what Durin found. The two argue about this, and eventually Gilgal tells Elrond to recite the songs of the roots of Kithaglir. There is no such song. Kithaglir means the misty mountains. What the fuck are you talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you. But first, all the Tolkien fans listening, I want you to sit down, take your hands and place them under your butt cheeks, and sit down really hard so you can't move them. That way, when I explain what happens, you won't give yourself a fucking concussion from how hard you'll facepalm. So, according to the show, there was once an elf who fought a Balrog on a tree on one of the peaks of the Misty Mountains, a tree in which one of the lost Silmarils was supposedly hidden. The elf poured all of his light into the tree to protect it, and the Balrog poured in all his darkness to destroy it. And then the tree was struck by lightning, merging the three powers, the good, the bad, and the Silmaril, and the power seeped into the mountain, creating Mithril. What, 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 what do you think you're doing? Where are you going? Don't click off the tab. I have to watch this show. Sit there, because I'm not finished. See, the fate of the Eldar rests in the Mithril because darkness has overtaken some tree, and now the light of the Eldar is fading. Gilgal thought that getting rid of strong woman would solve the problem, but no. They are losing their light, and without the Mithril, all the elves will have to leave Middle-earth or die. Let's just get the easy one out the way. The Eldar don't lose their light. They're immortal. When they're killed, their souls go to the Halls of Mondos where they wait to be reincarnated with a body matching their previous one. The only way any elf can lose their life is if they are of the same line of Elrond. Then they can choose a mortal life. That is it. Of course, if this presence of evil and conflict causes darkness to spread and kill the elves, how the fuck are they still alive? They spent an entire age, 600 years, fighting Morgoth, the original Dark Lord, the dude who literally injected the entire world with darkness, embedding his power throughout most of nature. In the entirety of the elves' existence, there was never more darkness than in the first stage. So how in the hell did they survive that? But now that there's a few thousand orcs, a handful of trolls, and some elf with dried jism on his face, now the elves are dying? Better yet, how do you know the Mithril will help you? And how are you going to get the power? What, are you going to crush it up and drink it or stick it up your booty hole? Are you going to touch the stone and it gives you back your mojo? By the way, the elf is supposed to be Glorfindel. He fought a Balrog to the death on one of the peaks of the Echorion. That's the encircling mountains that protected Gondolin, which was in Beleriand, which in the Second Age is buried under the sea. There was no tree, and there definitely was no Silmaril. One of the Silmarils is on Erendil's brow as he sails through the stars. One was with Mithros when he threw himself into a fiery chasm. The last one was tossed into the sea by Maglor. The Silmarils will be recovered after Dagor Dagoroth, and Feanor will break them, allowing Yavanna to use their power to restore the two trees. There is no Silmaril in a tree. It can't be destroyed by lightning or infused into a mountain, and it damn sure doesn't grant anyone life. Everything about this scene is wrong, and the showrunners owe Tolkien an apology for pissing all over his work in this shitty-ass fashion. You should be ashamed of yourselves that you would bastardize this man's work in such a way. What a fucking embarrassment. And the farce continues. Elrond won't break his oath to Durin, so gil gives some idiotic speech about hope and tells Elrond to find another way. Back in Numenor, Isildur goes to his friends to try to talk the new lieutenant into getting them onto the ship. He even allows the dude to punch him, which he does, but he still refuses to help Isildur. At no point in the scene does Isildur attempt to explain why he wants to go to war when the previous day he wanted to go west. He just changed his mind for no reason, and the writers didn't even bother to have his friends question his decision. Later that night, Kimmon decides to sneak on a ship and burn it to stop the war, because obviously a seafaring nation only has one ship. He cracks open what looks like wine or oil barrels and goes to light them with a lantern when he hears a cough and finds Isildur stowed away on the ship. So apparently no one is watching the ships, even though a number of people are against the war and hate strong woman because she's an elf. They're going to set sail in the morning, so you'd think there'd be at least some last minute preparations being made, but no, totally abandoned ship. Anyway, Isildur sees the liquid, realizes what Kimmon's up to, and fights him over the lantern, which breaks, sets Kimmon's cape on fire, which he throws towards the liquid, and they flee to the deck. Kimmon slips, but Isildur saves him just as the ship, and all the ones next to it go full Bruckheimer. I guess they were all made of explodium, but only the warships. The other ships? Totally fine. Elendil rescues the two, but doesn't question why Isildur is there. 
The boy tells him he saved Kimmon, who was in the boat just floating around near the warships in the dead of night. Elendil knows Isildur wants onto the ship, and knows Farazan, Kimmon's father, hates elves. He should question why either of them are there, but no. He just accepts the bullshit story and informs Queen Bee. Farazan tries to talk her out of sending the ships, but Strong Woman says they still have three left, and that Queen Bee should remember her father. Just pure manipulation. Queen Bee closes the council and says they'll meet again in the morning with Discount Aragorn to decide what to do. Meanwhile, Elrond talks with Celebrimbor about the Mithril, which he gave to Celebrimbor to test, thereby breaking the oath he just bitched about. Nicely done, writers. Celebrimbor confirms that nothing diminishes the Mithril's light, and that if they get enough of it, they can wash themselves in the light of the Valar and be immortal again. The elves don't get their powers from the Valar. Their power is their own. The Silmarils also don't contain the light of the Valar. They contain the light of the two trees, and this power isn't imparted onto anyone. Celebrimbor then tells Elrond some nonsense story about seeing Erendil before he left to plead for the Valar's help against Borgoth, claiming Elrond's mother Elwing didn't want Erendil to go, which is odd because she was the only one who stayed with him on his quest. But this is all a pretense for giving Elrond the courage to ask for Durin's help, which he would have done anyway, making this scene pointless. Then we get to see how manipulative, borderline, evil, strong woman can be. She goes to meet with Discount Aragorn to get him to side with her into going to Middle-earth. To do this, she pretends to apologize to him for using him, as she proceeds to use him. He still wants no part of this because of all the horrible things he's done to survive, and how men like him fall alongside the enemy. And yes, she says the line, men like you, not you yourself. This is intercut with the villagers from the watchtower kneeling before Aldar. Strong Woman then repeats the BS Fenron told her about finding light in the darkness, and Discount Aragorn finally asks what everyone else has been asking. Why are you still chasing at the Sauron? And her reason? because she can't stop. And that would make sense if she'd actually been fighting someone the whole time. But since all the fighting stopped centuries ago, this just makes her look stupid. Yes, she's been proven right about the return of Sauron, but that just happened. She spent hundreds of years chasing ghosts, turning away anyone who supported her, and she's so wrapped up in her own head that she can't see the truth of anything. She tells Discount Aragorn that her soldiers mutiny against her, and that Elrond sold her out because none of them can tell her from the enemy. Nope, that's literally not what happened. The soldiers mutinied because she disobeyed orders from the High King, wouldn't listen to anyone's advice, wanted to take the soldiers further north with zero support, and was willing to let them freeze to death just to achieve her goals. Elrond flat out tells her that he just wants her to be happy and thinks Valinor is the only place where she can do it. She knows what she's saying is a lie, and she lies to discount Aragorn to get him to feel sorry for her so he'd do something like apologize for her suffering, which he does, so she can throw it in his face, which she does, so she can then claim that neither of them can find peace in Numenor, only in Middle-earth, which she does. So this whole thing, including the sob story, is just to trick this man into helping her sacrifice hundreds of Numenorians so she can finger-bang away her revenge in Middle-earth. She even gives him back his fake ass Elisar for good measure. Back in the Southlands, the old tavern dude pledges his allegiance with Adar, assuming that Adar is Sauron, but that only enrages the elf. Adar forces the man to prove his loyalty with blood. Blood of the pussy who left Theo behind. The scene cuts before we can see if the man kills the boy. It goes to a Rondir teaching Theo how to shoot an arrow, and Theo being everything I hate about teenagers. He's basically giving up, but not really, but pretending to so he can be against whatever the grown-ups support. Because. He does have a point, though, that it says a lot about his people that half of them left. A Rondir says half stayed, including Theo, but still. Half of these people who haven't served a Dark Lord in hundreds, if not thousands of years, just turned when given a chance. Yeah, that's a problem. Theo also comes clean about the sword, which Arondir has seen before. Apparently, it's used to sacrifice and or control people, like we can see on the mural. So, like a completely normal person, when Bronwyn sees this, she gives up. Yes, the strong woman who is supposed to be in charge because vagina, sees a mural showing her thousand-year-old ancestors doing fucked up things, so she just gives up. In six hours, she went from stand and fight to full-on Jar Jar Binks. Now Arondir has to convince her not to lose hope. And Bronwyn says the tower will fall, and then they both look at the tower like they can, what, topple the tower and block the orcs? Because this is the line of the orcs coming to them. They'd kill the first few hundred, and then the other thousands would step over the rubble and keep coming. Of course, if you can see them from this far away, then you probably should have been able to see the fucking trench. Now, no Rings of Power episode would be complete without some retarded line of dialogue. Elrond meets with Durin and confronts him about lying about the table. 
He then tries to explain what's troubling him in some poetic way. And Doran says this, and I've pulled it from the show so you know I'm not lying. Enough with the quail sauce. Give me the meat and give it to me raw. And that, children, is why gay men have AIDS. It wasn't me. I didn't write it. Don't get mad at me. They wrote it. I'm just saying what everybody's thinking. Finally, we get to the end of this episode. Some guard calls for discount Aragorn for the council meeting. He gets up, but throws away his fake Elisar on the table, and then 13 seconds later, yes, I counted, he picks it up. Because it only takes 13 seconds to go from, I don't want to be king, to, fuck it, I'll do it. So now comes the march, where all the troops bedecked in their armor march to the docks to sail to Middle-earth. This armor design is hit or miss. Somehow, Discount Aragorn has the best armor that's a different color than everyone else's and fits him perfectly. It at least looks like actual armor, except for the parts where he doesn't have any gloves or gauntlets to protect his hands, and apparently no leg armor or even greaves, because obviously no one's going to try to attack his legs, and also no helmet, because nobody goes up there. Then we've got Queen Bee's armor, which looks ill-fitting. The breasts are a little high up, and again, no helmet or gauntlets. More troubling, though, are her arms. Look closely. That's fabric. It doesn't even look like padded fabric. It looks like someone print screened the scale texture on a compression shirt. You couldn't have called up Richard Taylor at Weta and been like, hey, you got that chainmail you used 20 years ago in Lord of the Rings. Can I borrow it for a minute? You had $250 million for the season and you print screened the fucking armor? And it's not just her. All the soldiers in the scale armor have this print screened look. Don't think, by the way, that I missed that Ellen Deal is wearing a helmet straight out of the Fellowship prologue. Or that the others look like they're wearing Rohan helmets. Or that there are women in the much bemoaned boob armor. I saw it. I just don't care. Because I'm genuinely confused why half the armor looks okay and the rest looks like it was printed at FedEx. But not as confused as I am about strong woman's armor. It's completely different from everyone else's. So where does she get the armor? The star symbol looks like the star of the House of Feanor. But why would that be on Numenorian armor? Or is this supposed to be Elvish armor? How would it have survived all the conflict of the First Age? And why would Numenorians have it? Also, how come the chainmail or that buzz you're calling chainmail is just hanging out of parts of the armor? What is it supposed to protect? And it looks so thin, it probably wouldn't block a goddamn thing. I also love how she has metal hip guards, but chainmail for the front. But maybe that's because if you want to hit her in a cootie cat, you'd have to aim for her head. And again, no gauntlets, just chainmail hanging over the wrist. The armor looks sloppy, too big for the actress, and half finished. Incidentally, House of the Dragon has the same budget, maybe slightly less, and their armor looks spectacular. But I mean, at this point, saying House of the Dragon is a better show is redundant. It's interesting, though, that this episode broke so many of the show's defenders. There's something about what happened in this episode. The lore-breaking, the stupid dialogue, the insufferable, unlikable characters. Something about this episode just graded everyone. I think the narrative is breaking. This idea that anyone who criticizes the show hates women and minorities can't explain away the bad writing. The bigger issue for Amazon is there may not be any way to fix this. Strong woman is a conniving, self-absorbed liar. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to redeem her? What could you possibly do to make her into Galadriel? How are you going to redeem the hobbits? I assume in the last three episodes they might warm up to Meteor Man now that he saved one of them, but they still have these barbaric rules. Even if they ditch the rules, it doesn't undo what we've seen them do. They're horrible people. How do you fix Bronwyn, a strong woman who gave up the second she felt despair? What are you going to do with Isildur, who appears to have no real goals and motivations? All the people we're supposed to care about are either terrible people or we know nothing about them. This is what happens when you're more concerned with checking a box than telling a story. The showrunners and actors have spent months telling us they're doing things nobody's ever done before. But they were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop and think if they should. They created this fake version of Tolkien's Middle Earth, pretending to delve into his works to tell a story he never told and make them better. But they have no understanding of what this man wrote. I just watched a couple of retrospective videos by TJ the Emperor on the Xenosaga video game series. It's the spiritual successor to my favorite video game, Xenogears. Both series are loaded with philosophical and religious concepts, from Carl Jung to Gnostic Christianity. Xenosaga was meant to tell the story Hiromichi Tanaka and his wife Kunihiko had intended to tell in Xenogears, but weren't able to because of time constraints and the size of the work. However, Xenosaga proved to be just as massive and too big for them to complete. In fact, Tanaka's inability to complete episode 1 the way he wanted, for the second time now, may have been the reason he stepped away from the series. Now, Kunihiko had written a script for episode 2, but this was tossed out after Tanaka stepped down. A new team was brought in, and whatever they used to write the new story paled in comparison to the original script. 
Why am I bringing this up? Well, one of the new writers flat out admitted he didn't understand the story and had the barest comprehension of what inspired it. Unsurprisingly, the story is a complete mess, wildly different from anything in Xenogears or in Episode 1 of Xenosaga. And as a result, Episode 2 wasn't well received by fans. It turns out that in order to tell a story someone else didn't tell, you need to understand what inspired them and understand the world they created at least as well as they do, otherwise you're going to fuck it up. That's what happened with Xenosaga Episode 2. That's what happened with Season 7 and 8 of Game of Thrones. And that's what's happening with the Rings of Power. It's not just a lack of respect for Tolkien and his work, but a lack of understanding of the world of Middle-earth and what inspired it. Without that knowledge, you are damned to write a weak story, and that's what we're seeing. You can't just crack open a book and borrow some lines and think that's going to cut it. You need to know this world and love it enough to want to see it presented as the person who created it would have done, not just do what you want to do. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.